Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Today is April the 10th, 2018. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm fully aware that the views expressed in this video are a minority view. I've spoken with a bunch of boxing fans who really believe that this is a golden era of heavyweight brilliance, right? I get it. I get it. I understand, too, the records speak for themselves. Anthony Joshua, 100%, well, used to be 100%, right? Close to 100% KO ratio. Only one of his fights have gone the distance. Deontay Wilder, same thing. Only one of his fights have gone the distance. You're talking about heavyweights who physically are big by historical standards. Right, Anthony Joshua is 6'6", and he's the shorter man in the ring if he fights against Deontay Wilder. So I get all the hullabaloo. I get the idea that Wilder has a belt. Joshua has a few belts, right? Joshua's already a unified heavyweight champion. Clearly, if we're going to see the very best of the heavyweight division, we would want to see Wilder in against Anthony Joshua. So, I understand the sides are negotiating with each other, right? And I think the negotiation is the right move, but for a different reason than the rest of the public. Now, first, let me say this. You know, we the fans, um, all of us, will judge fighters by their wins and losses. But the reality is that professional prize fighting is for a prize. It's the fighter's livelihood, right? So a fighter can actually lose a fight or at least lose a fight officially and still have a remarkably successful career, still be financially set for life. I want people to look closely at Joseph Parker right now. Just to understand, depending on reports, Parker made between 7.5 million pounds and 13.5 million pounds for his recent fight with Anthony Joshua, right? Part of the fight was a share of the gate, a share of the box office revenue, a share of the pay-per-view, right? But just understand, Joseph Parker, if he never fights again, is financially set for life. Understand how big the heavyweight division is. Joseph Parker has made more money than probably 95% of the fighters currently fighting. Right? The purse, it was that huge. Understand other champions are lucky to get seven figures for a fight. Here was a guy who conceivably may have gotten more than eight figures for his fight against Anthony Joshua. Now, all of us assume, I know I assume, that Joseph Parker's gonna continue to fight, right? He's in his mid-20s. We view him as just getting started, right? For many watching this video, they're going to think to themselves, you know, he's unproven, right? Beating Andy Ruiz, beating Yui Fury, that doesn't enconce him in the Boxing Hall of Fame, right? He's unproven. But what people need to realize is that of all the people around them, few, if any, are going to earn the money in their careers that Joseph Parker has already made by his mid-twenties. 
right? If your son or daughter came to you and said, Dad, I have more than 7.5 million pounds in the bank, many of us would say, hey, you're going to retire, right? Especially if the job's dangerous. Let's say your kid is a steel worker. Let's say your kid is a construction worker who's walking on the frames of skyscrapers, helping build them. Let's say you understand that one bad step, one mistake could end their careers, could leave them maimed, right? Let's say your kid's a butcher. Let's say that meat cleaver comes down the wrong way and hits a finger or two or three, right? You might actually say to your kid before that happens, you know, son, since you have seven and a half million pounds in the bag, maybe you want to quit that butcher job. Maybe you want to quit that construction job, right? So just understand from a financial security standpoint, Joseph Parker doesn't need the sport of boxing, nor does Anthony Joshua at this point. Deontay Wilder, before the big payday with Anthony Joshua, already is a multimillionaire. Quite frankly, all of these men <laughs> could walk away from the sport. In my opinion, when you have an opportunity to set yourself up for life, no matter how unproven we feel, Deontay Wilder is right now. And Wilder at this point doesn't have the money that Parker and Joshua have, right? Joshua, according to reports, cleared over 20 million pounds for his fight against Joseph Parker. Just understand that by signing the dotted line, making it to the night of the fight, and actually starting the fight against Anthony Joshua. Wilder would not have to work another day in his life. Right? Think about it. Now, let me say this. The reason why the fight needs to happen next, in my opinion, besides the money involved, it would be the biggest fight in boxing, right? Understand all of the other big fights we think about. Golovkin against Canelo. Errol Spence against Keith Thurman. Manny Pacquiao against Terrence Crawford, right? Name me the big fight out there. And I'll tell you that there's none bigger by a wide margin than Joshua and Wilder, right? But understand, the reason the fight needs to be made is because, quite frankly, number one, both of these guys are vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Let's be clear here on Deontay Wilder. Understand, there was a point during Wilder's reign happened in his last fight against Luis Ortiz, where Wilder's title was not in his hands, but it was in the hands of the doctor looking into his eyes. Understand, when they delayed the start of a round, because Wilder got the you-know-what beaten out of him, the prior round by Luis Ortiz, Understand that if that doctor looked at Wilder's pupils and felt the pupils didn't look right, the pupils were dilated or what have you, there was nothing Wilder could have done to save his title if the doctor simply turned and waved off the fight. Right? Think it through. Understand, too, how bizarre that scene was. New York has to get it together better. Why did Wilder have a minute to rest before the doctor actually examined him? 
Shouldn't the time for the doctor to examine Wilder have happened right at the end of the round? Right? We don't, we don't stop counts when the bell sounds for the round, right? They don't go eight, nine, then the bell sounds and you say, hey, hold on. Joe, we'll pick this up after you've rested for a minute. Right? These days, you really can't be what they call saved by the bell. Here, you're telling me. You're telling me that Wilder had a minute to rest before the doctor looked at Wilder at the start of the next round. Well, let me just say, under those highly peculiar circumstances, I believe one reasonably, we're not being adventurous here, we're being reasonable, one reasonably could conclude that Luis Ortiz is a hell of an opponent for Deontay Wilder. That if Luis Ortiz were to fight Wilder again, quite frankly, we don't know who would win that fight. I'll even go further and say that whatever the betting line was, for that fight, and I believe Wilder was a greater than two to one favorite, it would be much more narrow now. Because people realize that Luis Ortiz came within a doctor's ruling of winning the fight. And that doctor's ruling, oddly enough, came after Wilder had not 10 seconds but 60 seconds between rounds to recover. Right, let's just say I've seen some fights where guys have been blown out and are on the canvas unconscious. And even a guy like that, George Groves against Carl Frotch in the rematch, even a guy like that after 60 seconds might be able to appear lucid to a referee. Understand, in boxing history, the heavyweight division, you've had fights where there's an outcry for generations over a long count, right? Gene Tunney against Jack Dempsey. A long count that may have gone over by, what, a few seconds? Not tens of seconds. Think about how preposterous that Jack Dempsey-Gene Tunney fight would have been if they waited until the start of the next round to check on Gene Tunney. That wouldn't have flown in the 1920s. So let's just say Wilder, and I'm not even talking about guys he hasn't fought, who look like they would give him all he could handle. Right? Think about Alexander Povetkin. What I want you to do is to Google the number of stitches that David Price needed after Prevetkin stops him. Right? Price needs stitches in multiple locations, around his eyes, in his mouth. Right? Understand who Prevetkin is. People are in love with Anthony Joshua in part because he was an Olympic gold medalist. So too was Prevetkin. Prevetkin we don't have to speculate on whether he could be a heavyweight champion because he's already been a heavyweight champion. Right? We don't have to speculate about Wilder against Dylan White. Didn't Dylan White just beat a tall guy? What kind of condition was Lucas Brown in at the end of that fight? Right? So just understand, of the people... Wilder has fought. One wonders if Wilder would be able to survive Luis Ortiz again. Right? Let me also say, too, Ortiz's own corner has criticized Luis a little bit for not going to the body in that fight. There are certain things Ortiz could have done that he's done in other fights that he didn't do against Wilder. My point to you is, at this point, Wilder's choices are to fight dangerous opponents, 
right? Dangerous opponents. In defense of his title. Or to fight a dangerous opponent in Anthony Joshua. With a chance to unify the heavyweight titles. For more money. Right? When you're a vulnerable fighter, and that's what I consider Wilder. A vulnerable fighter, just look how close the scorecards are in the Luis Ortiz match. At the time of the stoppage. Right? You need to take the biggest payday and the highest glory. Because if you don't, if you fight a fighter who doesn't have the belts, you're going to be taking undue risk for not as big a reward. Now let's talk about Anthony Joshua. Now let me say this. Before the Laura Hurd fight, Hall of Famer, Jim Gray, on the Showtime telecast here in the United States, caught up with Hall of Famer Mike Tyson, right, and asked him about boxing. Now understand, these former champions, right, who are often asked about boxing, especially the heavyweights, Lennox Lewis, George Foreman, right, Mike Tyson, Larry Holmes, they'll, they'll catch up with these guys. And these former heavyweight champions, in my opinion, are almost always grateful for what the sport has provided them. They recognize there's a lot of money involved and they want to help out the younger champions. Right? They want to praise the sport. They want to make sure that whatever comments they make Portray the sport in a good light. Leave the sport on the road for more financial abundance while also being truthful to boxing fans who they know are the lifeblood of the sport in terms of their assessment of a young champion's recent performance. So here you have Mike Tyson uh, with Jim Gray. And I got the feeling Mike Tyson... <laughs> I got the feeling Mike Tyson is going out of his way to try to put a positive spin on his comments. In other words, he doesn't want to criticize anybody too much. He doesn't want to be the bitter old guy who wants you to know that he would beat the young guy. Doesn't want to be that guy. Even as current champions like Deontay Wilder are calling him out saying, I would have beaten prime Mike Tyson, right? Here you have the real Mike Tyson. And he wants to sound positive. But in the interview with Jim Gray, where Mike congratulates Jim Gray on getting in the Hall of Fame, in other words, Mike's pubbing the sport, right? As you watch the interview, you're aware of the fact that, you know, Mike has a lot of respect for Jim Gray. Jim Gray has a lot of respect for Mike Tyson. But Mike Tyson, with regard to Anthony Joshua, was very honest. He said, look, I was disappointed. That's Mike's word. <laughs> I was disappointed in Joshua's recent performance. Disappointed. Now, I know the press isn't reporting it this way. But Anthony Joshua had practically every advantage imaginable in his fight against Joseph Parker, right? The fight is in Anthony Joshua's backyard. Right? It's in Anthony Joshua's backyard. You had a referee, if, if anyone had questions about stamina, those questions related to Anthony Joshua's stamina, not Joseph Parker's stamina, right? Joseph Parker has been 12 rounds. Anthony Joshua had not before this fight. You had a referee that created a stop and go pace to the fight. In other words, the fight starts to get rough and tumble. It starts to get to a place where you think, hey, if it hits a fever pitch, maybe stamina becomes an issue later. And the ref would jump in and separate the fighters. How bad was it? Understand that 
As it is, Parker lands more power punches according to CompuBox. Many of those power punches are body shots. Right? What kept Parker away from Joshua's body more? I would argue it was the referee more so than Anthony Joshua. So you have Mike Tyson diplomatically saying, look, Joshua disappointed me in his last fight. Understand, in my opinion, one man's opinion, I said it in the post-fight interview. Right? If, if, these two guys, Parker and Joshua, fought the same fight, the same fight in New Zealand, the exact same fight, it would have been scored differently. Folks, I'll just put it to you this way, right? When a guy is landing more body shots, that's significant. Now, I know the Joshua side of the argument is going to say, well, Joshua landed more jabs, right? But at the same time, you saw the fight. Look at Parker's face. Folks, Parker's face, apart from a cut everyone can see, it was caused by an elbow, looks unmarked. Joshua's jab did not succeed in keeping Parker away from his body. Let's agree that in a fight where Joshua was a huge favorite, greater than five to one, he didn't meet expectations. The fight was more competitive than many people thought. I know that's not how it was presented, right? But the fight's far more competitive than many people thought. You change the location of that fight. You change the referee in that fight. And I'll venture a guess right here that the betting spread on a rematch between Joshua and Parker would narrow significantly. Right? Parker already knows. Hell, we already know that a guy can go the distance against Anthony Joshua. Let me also say this too. 100%, 100% KO ratios are impressive. But I agree with Tyson Fury. Look at the Carlos Tackham ending involving Anthony Joshua. Now Joshua is winning that fight. Right, Josh was winning that fight. As many here online know, I personally believe that Tackham beat Parker. Right, I said so in the post-fight video for that fight. Right, Joshua did better against Tackham than did Parker. Let's keep it real here. Let's keep it 100. Right, but let's just say Carlos Tackham wasn't in trouble at the end of the Joshua fight. That was a stoppage more by the referee than by Anthony Joshua. In fact, Tackham, go back and look at the film. Tackham looks surprised that the fight's being stopped. Right, he, he's not a guy getting shelled where the ref stops the fight and Tackham just looks down and says, thank God, right? You know, there's, there's none of that. Ref jumps in, stops the fight. You get the feeling Carlos Tackham could have gone the distance against Anthony Joshua. Well, Joseph Parker did. He's not close to getting knocked out in the last round. Then you look at the numbers and you realize that Parker lands more power shots. In other words, Parker doesn't survive against Joshua by being on his bike, running. No, he's engaging Anthony Joshua. In fact, Parker's corner is a little upset that Parker didn't engage him more. But yet, as it was, Parker landed more power shots. So in my opinion, Wilder and Joshua are both vulnerable. 
I'm not confident that either guy beats their opponent, their last opponents. If there's a rematch and the fight is fought in a neutral location. Right? I'm not sure if either guy survives Alexander Povetkin. Let me say this too. Povetkin's an odds play. If a Povetkin fight is announced against either guy, wherever it is, and keep in mind, Povetkin just destroyed David Price in the United Kingdom. If Povetkin is going off at a 3-1 to one or higher, that's the value side of the play. Povetkin's only lost once, and that was by decision to a Vladimir Klitschko who was not as rusty, hadn't had the months of inactivity that he had before the Joshua fight. So understand, Wilder versus Joshua is right now the fight the public wants to see. It's the biggest money fight in boxing. If Wilder signs the bottom line, he's set financially for life. I believe if you're a handler for these fighters, you understand that you have to take that fight. Why? Because there's too much risk involved in these guys fighting anyone else. Right? Understand, if a Mike Tyson was a greater than 5-1 to one favorite fighting a guy at home in his prime, and that fight went the distance, and then you looked at the compu box, and the other guy landed more body shots, landed more power punches, and you felt that the referee didn't allow his opponent, who already landed more power punches, from following up and getting inside and throwing even more against Mike Tyson, you would consider that a disappointing fight. You would have questions about the winner. Well, understand, all of those questions get swept under the rug. We don't have to talk about Alexander Povetkin. We don't have to talk about Dylan White. We don't have to talk about the inconvenient guys at heavyweight who would give these guys a hard time. Let me include in that list people like David Hay. We don't have to even consider them. These guys have political cover. They would be able to say, hey, I'm fighting to unify the titles. Right? Let's go one step further, too, in terms of unification. I'm going to throw out what I believe are the four major sanctioning bodies. Right? Compare my notes to your notes. The WBC. The IBF. The WBO and the WBA. Right now, let's be careful in our choice of words. Right? We're measuring our use of words against history. When we say unified, all we're talking about is that a guy has more than one of these belts. Right? That's what unified is. Now, if you're going to use the term undisputed, undisputed, then in my opinion, the guy has to have every world championship issued by these four sanctioning bodies. Right? And I mean world championship, not intercontinental or pan-Asian or what have you. If you're going to be the undisputed champ, you need to have the WBC World Championships, the IBF World Championships, the WBO World Championships, the WBA World Championships. Now, these sanctioning bodies, and I'll concede this, have made it tough for any fighter to reach that threshold. Quite frankly, if there's an undisputed champion, you need to pay close attention to that guy because that's going to be short-lived. Because there are too many belts and too many mandatories. A fighter who no doubt has become heavyweight champ and wants to enjoy a championship lifestyle 
doesn't want to be in training 365 days a year preparing for a fight against the WBC mandatory, the IBF mandatory, the WBO mandatory. Well, just to understand, a fight between Wilder and Joshua wouldn't be for the undisputed heavyweight championship. Let's not equate the winner with Lennox Lewis. Because even though Lewis didn't have to deal with this, understand these guys have to deal with the fact that the WBA heavyweight champion, the regular one, is Manuel Char. It's someone else. Manuel Char can't lose his belt by these two guys fighting each other. Now, some of you in the comment section to earlier videos have pointed out that Anthony Joshua is a WBA super heavyweight champion. Okay, that's fine and dandy. That's fine and dandy. But understand the WBA has another belt, and it's not a junior belt. It's a world championship. These sanctioning bodies, I know they've split up their belts, right? Super champion, regular champion. In my opinion, and we could debate this, the powers that be can weigh in on this. You're not undisputed unless you own both the super belt and the regular belt. You can't have other guys from your own sanctioning body having a share of the title. Understand, too, Manuel Char gets the belt by beating Alexander Ustinov. In other words, he wasn't awarded the belt. He wasn't given the belt from Anthony Joshua. It's not like the WBA said, hey, Joshua has a belt. Now we're just going to have a little, you know, ceremony here where we give some other belt. No. The belt Manuel Char has was fought for. It was earned in the ring. When we say Lennox Lewis was the undisputed heavyweight champion, folks, there are no world championship belts issued by the major sanctioning bodies at that time that Lewis didn't have. You can't have Manuel Char fighting Fresa Kendo in defense of his WBA heavyweight championship, world heavyweight championship, and then tell me that the winner of a fight between two other guys is for the undisputed heavyweight championship. Part of the heavyweight championship is the belt Manuel Char owns. So let me just say, because the public is a little confused here, they think that Joshua against Wilder would be for the undisputed heavyweight championship. Because they're all caught up in the hype, and quite frankly, because I believe both Wilder and Joshua know that there's some mandatory contenders out there who these guys wouldn't want to fight for less money than they're getting by fighting each other. Right? In my opinion, it's because of concerns over the ability of Wilder and Joshua to beat everyone in the heavyweight division. It's because of the holes in their game. It's because Wilder kept his belt because a doctor passed him after he had 60 seconds to recover. It's because Joshua kept his belt even though he was a greater than 5-1 to one favorite fighting at home and yet still found a way to land less power punches than his opponent and somehow win by wide margins on each judge's scorecards. Right? Scoring that would never happen if the fight were in a different location. 
It's because of the uncertainties in the reigns of these champions that, in my opinion, they need to fight each other. Right? The public thinks these two guys are the best two guys in the division. Great. Let the public think that. Let's get this money. Let's cash these checks. Reporters want to throw around the word undisputed. They want to put these guys in the same boat with Lennox Lewis. Let them go ahead and do that. That's all fine. Let's get this money. Let's cash these checks. I know promoters are going to do what they do. And, you know, people want you to believe that Anthony Joshua is demanding that the fight take place in the United Kingdom. I got to tell you, all Deontay Wilder has to do is look at the check just cashed by Joseph Parker. And Wilder, who was on his way to Russia to fight Alexander Povetkin when that fight got canceled, will have absolutely no problem finding his way to the airport to get to the United Kingdom for the match. Right? Either of these guys could lose the match. Neither of these guys right now is unbeatable. Right? One of the MVPs in Wilder's championship reign was the doctor in the Luis Ortiz fight. Right? Anthony Joshua for the love fest they had against Joseph Parker has his own MVP in that referee. Right? Joshua wisely has decided, look, I'm not going to leave home. Why would you when you're getting scoring on your fights like this after you've been outlanded on power shots? So let's hope the fight gets made. Understand, too, these guys need a rematch clause, don't they? Don't they? Because they're going to get big money the first time. Huge money the first time. Isn't it safer to fight in a rematch for big money the next time than it would be to actually give Luis Ortiz a rematch? Give Joseph Parker a rematch at a local location with a different referee? Fight an Alexander Povetkin who just went to the UK and blew up David Price. Fight a David Hay who, let's be blunt here, even at David Hay's age, he has faster hands. Faster hands than both of these guys. Right? You think if David Hay hits Deontay Wilder, Wilder's going to be able to hug him like Wilder hugged Luis Ortiz? I look forward to the fights. I understand the comment section here is going to say, Dwyer, you're a hater. You lost on the Ortiz fight, and I did. You lost on the Joseph Parker fight, I did. You're being bitter toward two young heavyweight champions. You're not giving these young guys their due. Right? To that, let me just say, look at the Jim Gray, Mike Tyson interview. Tyson is so magnanimous in that interview. <laughs> That Jim Gray asks him, do you feel Deontay Wilder would have beaten you in your prime? And Tyson says, you know, I don't know. I'd have to be there. That's Tyson's response. And even in that kind of interview where Tyson's trying to sound positive and upbeat, the Hall of Fame former champion had to say he was disappointed in Anthony Joshua's performance in his last fight. Disappointed. Right? Just ponder that word. Just ponder it. As you think about Joshua's options and Wilder's options. Let me say this too. Some of these sanctioning bodies are going to come up with the bright idea of stripping the winner of Wilder Joshua, of their share of the title. Right? Why? Because let's say Alexander Povetkin is the mandatory. Whoever wins the Wilder Joshua fight's not going to be in a rush to fight that man. 
sooner or later a sanctioning body is going to have to step in and say, look, if you're not going to fight our mandatory, then we can't have you as our champion. Right? So to the extent Wilder and Joshua were able to unify the title, just understand why of Vladimir Klitschko was unable to become the undisputed heavyweight champion. It's because these sanctioning bodies are demanding. And these fighters themselves know that there's certain guys they don't want to fight. That's how I see it in the Klitschko's case. His brother's champ for a while. The brothers didn't want to fight each other. I understand it. But just to understand it's very hard to have a unified heavyweight champion. Let's hope it happens. But with this cast of characters, I doubt it. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.